Hey. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, friends and viewers. Um, we're uh, welcome to You Choose. It's a choose your own adventure style show where we intend to navigate the entire CMCF landscape. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of chapter one. The chapter one is to get to the application from a developer's laptop to a development environment. But before we dig in about where we've been and where we are and where we're going, I have a, I have a joke for you, Victor. I, I think you, you in particular will like this joke. Are you ready for this? <clears throat> Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? Say again. Sorry, I, I closed my ears. Say again. <laughs> Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? Because he's a clumsy nerd. <laughs> because, because it was dead. <laughs> okay, you need to practice on those. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't get it that no. time. I'll try. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's perfectly. F no, no. It's great. The problem. You know what's the problem with the joke? It, it was too short, so I did not know when to react to it. But now I know, and it's. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Oh, it's so amazing. Oh. Oh, love Victor. <laughs> but I, I'm sorry. I, I did not know when to do the reaction. So, so, so just for the you record, you're, you're, you're not super critical only of tech that you <laughs> find, but also of, of pretty innocent jokes that your friends tell you. <laughs> I just did not know when to react. That's all. If it was a funny joke, I don't think you have to think about it that hard. You just react. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's back to business. So so we're navigating, we're getting an application. I won't quit my day job to, to start a comedy. <laughs> we're getting our application from the developer's laptop to a development environment. In episode one, we talked about container build strategy and y'all voted and the winning technology was cloud native build packs. In episode two, that was last week, we, we talked about uh, Docker Hub or really distribution is the CNCF project in there, uh, Harbor and Dragonfly. So let's recap those technologies. Um, tell us about distribution. Please, Victor. Distribution is essentially not something anybody should use, but the base for building full-fledged registries, right? Gotcha. The other, uh, Docker Hub is based on distribution, and uh, the other one, which you're going to explain in a second, is based also on distribution. So think of it as a base layer to build something used by somebody. So like a toolkit, almost. Maybe. Like a toolkit, like almost uh -huh. like an SDK. Okay, gotcha. And then we heard from Adam Bauer, who is a maintainer, I think, of the Harbor project. And he talked about Harbor. And Harbor is a, a technology where you can host your own container registry. And it has a lot of additional features where you can scan your images for vulnerabilities. You can sign images as trusted. You can control access for your images, so role-based access control. Um, you can define image retention policies, so you can have your image, old images cleaned up for you, saving <clears> you a lot of time and money. And the other big one that came up a lot, I think, was image, um, was a replication, which, um, yes. yeah. And that's not only like replicating instances of your Harbor registry, but like if you have your Docker Hub uh, registry and you want to replicate that in a Harbor instance, you can do something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, is there anything you want to add about Harbor before we talk about nope. Dragonfly? It, yeah, All right. uh, you missed one thing. It's awesome. Okay. It's awesome. <laughs> Just our completely unbiased host views. <laughs> Two thumbs up for Harbor. <laughs> And then we talked about Dragonfly. So actually, all three of these technologies aren't direct competitors. They all can build on one another. So um, Dragonfly can actually work with Harbor. It's not an either or situation. And so Dragonfly, I'm going to be honest with you, Victor. Like in preparing the show, I, for the show, I like looked at the Dragonfly docs and it's like, OK, it's like a peer to peer networking system for all the nodes in your cluster. So you can move images around more easily. But I didn't really understand like like how much benefit that could impart, like how, like whether it's worthwhile. And so um, when Alan Sun came and talked about Dragonfly, it was actually great. Like, it's like, oh, that makes so much more sense. Because so 
Dragonfly is peer-to-peer -peer networking for your cluster to help move images around. But then there's a sub-project called NIDUS, N-Y-D-U-S, NIDUS, which is a different way to format your container images. So it's not OCI. And there are tools to convert your OCI images into NIDUS images. But the NIDUS image format has a couple of benefits. One is that the images are stored in pieces and can be stored across, like big images can be stored across multiple <clears throat> machines. And so that's where the the peer-to-peer -peer networking model of Dragonfly makes more sense to me. And then the second thing that NIDUS does is it can, um, it knows which parts of the image are necessary to start the container and downloads that first and gets the container started. So between the, to those two things, you can drastically cut the amount of time needed to start an image. So, so for all of those of you who cannot make decently sized images and count it in terabytes, well, <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> Instead of fixing your images, if you just want to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. For all of, all of you who are, who are dedicated to not, not fix the cause of the problem, but to have a workaround. <laughs> no, Victor just shamed you. If you want to use Dragonfly, you have to feel bad about it. No, it's great. Sounds great. I was not familiar well, actually... with it, but it sounds great. I'm new enough. I'm new enough to to learning everything. Like, what is a use case when you need a super huge container image? Uh, machine learning that loads data into a container image instead from a volume again because you're lazy. Uh, <laughs> legacy applications, you know, people okay. who that moved web logic to Kubernetes. Yeah. Oracle database. Everything Oracle. <laughs> So uh, Oracle is not coming to our show. That's now decided, Carol. Okay. So we lost one one speaker. Excellent. <laughs> That's what we're really doing on this show: <laughs> alienating every project in the CNC landscape one at a time. Except Harbor, apparently, which is awesome. <laughs> oh, here we have Sebastian says that Windows containers are all huge. So there you go. That helps answer my yeah, question. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Uh, so with that said, I think it's time to reveal who won. So we put it all to a vote on Twitter like we do. <clears throat> We've done it twice, but that's now like we do. Um, and the the <laughs> the winning technology is dun, 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 Harbor. Harbor is awesome. So that means that we're going to implement Victor right now is going to implement Harbor into our ongoing demo. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know how, how cool it is that we forced all people who can come to this show to share their window so that we check whether it works? But me? <laughs> oh, <you know. laughs> That's awesome, right? That's on uh, There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's my window, black window, right? You can see it, I we hope. We see a tunnel of shows. Yeah. An infinity tunnel, yeah. Ah, infinity tunnel? No, no, not mm -hmm. infinity. Oh. Okay, wrong, wrong one. I don't know how to share my screen. See, we are prepared. I'm telling you. We are one really of us is. Entire screen. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, do you see uh, black something? Yes. A dollar Excellent. sign. Excellent. A terminal. Dollar sign. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. People who expect to see pretty colors are going to be disappointed. Anyways. Uh, so, we already built the image. Uh, in the previous, uh, the beginning of the previous episode, now it's about pushing images, and it's about pushing images to Harbor. I installed Harbor. I'm not going to show that right now, simply because it's a simple hell command plus uh, certificates. So uh, let's continue from there, right? I have an environment variable with the address. So this is my domain where Harbor is running in my cluster, and I'm going to push CNCF demo image that we built before. So I'm going to. Uh, tag the image we built in the previous uh, episode, which was uh, this one. And I'm going to tag it so that it knows the address of Harbor. There we go. And I'm going to tag it as latest as well. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to push it. So you can use any Docker or Nurkatl or anything you, you like that you use for building and pushing. Push image tag. Right now, it's going to Harbor. I did not try this in advance. It might fail. We'll see. <laughs> it's, wor it's working. Good, 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 good. So I'm pushing the image to Harbor. It's pushing. It's pushing. It's Oops. still pushing. 
There we go. And I'm going to push the same just with the latest. Ah, not last, latest. Latest tag. There we go. And if I now go to Harbor, which I have opened somewhere, there we go. Uh, and I make it bigger and I refresh. You should see in library, right? CNCF demo. There we go. We have one image right now, one artifact. This is when it was modified last time. And here it is. That's the image is pushed there. I can copy the command to pull it if I want. I can use it. We're going to see now uh, further on in this uh, episode how to uh, how to use it. Anyways, two tags, not signed because I was lazy and not scanned uh, because that's not the scope of this. But you can scan it, you can sign it, you can do all the funky stuff you, you should do that you do or don't know that you should do. Anyways, that's hardware. That's as easy as that. Once you have it, it's just pushing it like anywhere else. Dun, da, da, da. Dun, da, da, da. There yes, we go. <laughs> Sing with me, Victor. <laughs> All no, right. No, no, no. We have. Uh, we already agreed that we have a guest who will be singing today. <laughs> uh, but that's a surprise for later. <laughs> I hope you're ready. Guest. You know who you <laughs> are. <laughs> um. So, that we. So that takes care of last <laughs> episode, and that brings us to episode three, chapter one, where we are right now where we need to choose a technology to define our application so that we can deploy it to the development environment. Now, I'm a relatively new learner, and I didn't know, there's like a lot of vocabulary that means the same thing. And for a long time, it took me, I didn't understand defining an application is the same as configuring an application, is the same as configuration management. Is that true? It's all the same thing. It's all the same thing or all different depending on who you ask. Uh, anyway, you need to define what an application is. Now call it uh -huh. however you want. You need to write. Uh -huh. So let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. It needs to be or become, in case of Kubernetes, YAML that goes to Kubernetes API. Mm -hmm. Now how we get to that YAML, that's the subject of today's episode. Nice. And then another thing that was unclear to me at this step was like what exactly is being defined what exactly is being configured and i never when i would ask someone i didn't really get a straight answer and now that i have a clear a clearer picture i understand that i didn't get a straight answer because there are so 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 many concerns that i, ha I have a very short answer to, to okay like uh, what's defined is pure madness <laughs> pure madness <laughs> yeah. because you know in the past <laughs> Uh, your application would be a jar file for your Java application, right? And you would uh -huh. run it on some server and that, that, there you go, right? Now right, you need yeah. to define deployment or maybe stateful set, service, virtual service, ingress, and so a bunch of Kubernetes objects. A yeah. bunch of Kubernetes objects. Now and one then, day, one day we will get to simplification of that with uh, things like Knative and things like that, which is, mm -hmm. I see I see Whitney's eyes already shine now. <laughs> uh, but right now we're talking about low level Kubernetes objects. Yes. Resources. So, so, so we, you talked when you did the Harbor demo just now, you're like, we'll get to the image de defining. So we're going to, that's going to be relevant today. How do we incorporate our container image, incorporate that container image, but it's not just like getting it in there in the first place. You got to be ready for all the, all the times you're going to update it. And how are you going to handle those updates and how are you going to manage, exactly. make sure you're running the container image you mean to run. And then there's, yeah. And that, that's essentially one of the reasons why we are not today using the most basic of all, which is pure YAML, right? Because mm -hmm. you can easily define whatever you need in pure YAML, but later on when you need, oh, new release, I changed the image, or change this, I change that, changing pure YAML is painful, unless you're yeah. uh, very <laughs> addicted to tools like YQ. We should have YQ here <laughs> in this show. Are there people out there who are addicted to tools like YQ? I is love it. Like <laughs> Like you anonymous meetings, like I just, yeah. I just can't move on. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's yeah. in a circle. All the tools that you will see today <laughs> are, are kind of insignificant compared to just write it in YAML and use YQ like crazy. <laughs> well, how does um how does infrastructure ma play in? Do you have to define that at this stage? Like, is that part uh, of so what you're? We'll we'll get to infrastructure later. For now, I assume mm -hmm. we assume kind of there is some cluster auto magically somewhere. It exists. <laughs> okay. Different different <laughs> sphere least, kind of. Like. 
know where it is and know how to connect to it as part yes. of this part piece of it. Mm -hmm. So what so what would you say, Victor, we're looking for when we're evaluating these four technologies that we're about to see? What what scaffold should we have in mind and what we're thinking evaluating? So it's really th there are two things that we are looking to solve with those tools. First, how to solve the complexity of having infinite amount of YAML lines, right? You might have things repeated too much, uh, things that are changing every once in a while. So some kind of, I was about to say templating, but templating is not the right word, but how to simplify the complexity. Actually, it's not complexity, but the sheer volume of mm -hmm. things you need to write and how that can be updated easily. How, how can you change the image tag? I'm now using one tag. How can I change it to some other tag without going crazy? So simplifying the experience of using the YAML in the first place, and then simplifying the experience of making updates to the YAML as, as different parts of your application change. Yes. So that's what we're, I mean, that's what we're what, looking what at. What is important for everybody to understand is that ultimately it needs to be YAML or JSON when it goes to Kubernetes API. But how do we get to that? beyond just writing thousands of lines of YAML. <laughs> it's all YAML, all YAML in the end. Um, do you want to, shall we bring, introduce our guests? You feel ready? Yes. Yeah, all wait, right. no, I'm not ready. Now I'm ready. <laughs> I got a task today, I'm the, I'm, I'm the time master. We have so, a, okay, go. I purposely didn't tell you, <laughs> you guessed that Victor's the one doing the clock today. <laughs> we're just going to introduce everyone now, though. So there's, extra, um, we're uh, going to bring, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, saying hello. Can I time that as well? No? Yeah, yeah, let's practice? make sure 15 uh, okay, seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm going to count aloud 15, 15, 14, wait, wait. 13, 12, <laughs> 11. <laughs> Ten, nine, this is Scott Rosenberg. Eight. Hello, Scott. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm uh, Scott Rosenberg, known as uh, the rabbi in the community, big lover of Carvel and YTT, which I'll talk about today. And yeah, happy to be here. So glad to have you, Scott. Thanks for coming. Next is Ellie. Welcome, Ellie. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Uh, so I'm Ellie. I uh, am the lead developer for the CDK project or CDK for Kubernetes. And um, yeah, excited to show you uh, what it is and uh, how we can uh, use it. Heck yeah. And next up is Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Welcome. Tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas. I work as a software architect in a Danish software company called Systematic. I'm the author of Cloud Native Spring in Action. And I'm a big contributor to open source technologies, specifically in the cloud native space. Amazing. Happy to be here. So happy to have you. And last but say not least. Say that at the end of the episode. Don't say it in advance. <laughs> 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 and last but not least, we have Andrew Block. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, everyone. Uh, Andrew Tell Block, Distinguished Architect at Red Hat. I'm a maintainer on the Helm project and do a lot of work around a number of open source technologies. Great to be here. Yeah, yay. It's a the gang's all here. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone except Thomas. Thomas is going to teach us about customize, and Victor is so excited about that clock, Thomas. So, Ooh, so, so uh, <laughs> going to be the first one being timed by Victor. <laughs> and remember yeah. what we agreed before the <laughs> session you're doing it in poetry. Go. <laughs> you're you, wasting your time. Yeah. You know that, right? Right now. What? <laughs> Take it away, Thomas. Oh, no, stop it, Victor. <laughs> so Customize is a great tool to manage configuration for uh, uh, applications in a Kubernetes environment. It works with uh, pure and standard YAML. That's why we call it a Kubernetes native solution. Uh, it comes as a CLI that you can install, but it's already included in uh, kubectl, So you can use it directly from your Kubernetes CLI. So what happens? We have an application containerized and published it to a container registry. We uh, wrote some manifest in order to deploy it, but now we have two challenges. First, we want to deploy it to uh, three different environments, but customizing the configuration a bit. And second problem, we want to handle all this manifest as a single coherent unit. Customize can help with that because uh, we want to have one replica in development, one, uh, three replicas in staging, and five replicas in production. So let, let's see how we can do that with customize. First of all, we define 
our original manifest as the base. Those are the base manifest. On top of those, we apply overlays. We create some patches in order to customize what needs to be different across environments. And we create an overlay for each environment, development, staging, and production. After that, with customize, we can start from a base. We apply the overlay on top of that, and finally deploy the result to the specific target environment. Let's have a look at how it works in code. Uh, I have here a folder structure. I have a base folder where I have my base manifest. I have a deployment and a service. And I use a customization object provided by Customize in order to combine together these resources. And then uh, the exciting part, I can define overlays for each environment. In development, you can see that I point to the base manifest. On top of those, I apply a patch. And this patch uh, customizes the number of replicas to one. You can see this is just a fragment of a Kubernetes manifest. And then I can also apply a namespace so that all the resources are deployed in development. Same thing in staging. I have a different namespace there and uh, three replicas, but I can do much more than that with customize. If we have a look at production, you can see that not only I can apply patches on top of base manifest, and this base manifest can be either locally available or from a remote GitHub repo, but I can also apply common labels and common annotations across all my manifest, which is quite convenient. I can generate uh, config maps or secrets from files and have customized trigger a rolling update so that my applications are always using the latest configuration available. And of course, every time we release a new container image, we need to change the tag on the manifest and we can do it directly from here. We don't even need to write a patch. And finally, I can apply that from kube control Instead of saying apply dash F, which is the standard Kubernetes manifest, I can say dash K and then point to overlays prod. And there it is. I have my application deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. So to sum up the main features of customize, we can customize it based on overlays. We can apply common labels and common annotations to all the base manifest. Uh, we can generate secrets and uh, config maps. We can even manage in a convenient way, namespaces and images. And finally, we can use Customize in a GitOps flow because Customize is directly available out of the box in Argo CD and Flux. So we can make it part of our continuous deployment strategy. And that was Customize. Back to you with me, Victor. That was amazing. Victor, <laughs> Victor didn't get to uh, give you a hard time. He's so, he's so excited. <laughs> There we go. I was muted. It makes me be in silence now for a minute or something until his time uh, goes out as a show of respect. Amazing. The sound of silence. Yes. Yeah. It's a really great job. I want to say goodbye to you. And next up, we have Andrew. Andy, welcome. Hey. So I don't have all the fancy slides. I'm sorry, but at least I can talk about Helm. So Helm is a package manager for, for Kubernetes. It is the de facto package manager for Kubernetes. Basically, it is awesome. Um, most products these days have a Helm component. A Helm allows you to create uh, applications very easily by combining templates and values. The combination of these two allow you to define Kubernetes manifests dynamically. And that's the best part about that is because it's leveraging a lot of the same technologies that many of you already use today. These templates are a combination of Golang-based templates. So many of our applications these days are Golang-based applications. So you're familiar with some of the contexts, constructs, pardon me, that come with these type of templates. But we also have some supercharged functions that come out of the box that also come with Helm to allow you to do certain parameters and customizations. Like I want to uppercase my characters. I want to go ahead and create a random number. I want to go ahead and do some simple math. All these come out of the box. You can go ahead and easily and dynamically customize your uh, Kubernetes manifest. That's one thing that's one of the benefits of Helm is the complete dynamic capabilities of Helm. And also in addition to that, you can also create dependencies on other charts. So Helm, allows you to release components as charts. Your charts allow you to be either um, packaged as a, um, can be stored on an Apache server, or pardon me, an HTTP server, or you can actually store these charts in an OCI-based registry. So you can leverage a lot of the same technologies that you're currently leveraging in other parts of your Kubernetes ecosystem for Helm. 
So you don't have to worry about finding a place to store your manifests. You can store them in the same OCI registry that you deploy your, your, your Kubernetes um, uh, images. It's really easy, really simple. There's a lot of integrations. Uh, there are plugins that allow you to integrate Helm with other tools. You can integrate, even customize. Customize can go ahead and even integrate Helm itself. So you can use Helm to do almost anything you want and more. And it's great, honestly. And that's about it. I like to just kind of give it a quick elevator pitch. It speaks for itself. Amazing. Good job. Uh, Whitney, you scared the heck out of people in the last episode, <laughs> kind of like. Now everybody's winning time. Amazing. <laughs> Good job. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Oops. Hi, Thomas. You just got a quick cameo there. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, you're up. Uh, uh -huh. Welcome. 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 Tell us about Carvel YTT. Yeah. So Carvel YTT is the ultimate YAML templating tool. Um, so what is YTT? YTT is a CLI based tool used to template and patch YAML files. And what's really interesting here is that we support both the templating mechanism of data values like Helm do, as well as the overlay uh, um, ideas like we have in Customize. So instead of having one or the other, we can actually have them both in a single tool in a really easy and convenient manner. Um, it also contains a really powerful templating engine using Starlark as the language, uh, which is a Pythonic dialect. It makes it really easy to really nerd out and add as much code as we need. But at the same time, we can also stay within YAML and not need to go out to code um, in many cases. And the real nice thing, it's YAML in, it's YAML out, and YAML all the way through. It really, we define everything in YAML. What we get out is YAML, and it's really cool. So let's see a few examples here of how YTT really comes uh, into play. So here, I'm just going to go into one of my folders. And let's see what, fold, what files we have here. We have a config directory with two files, a config file and a schema file. We have a CA cert file and four different values files. Let's try our first one. Let's take a look. This is what our values file looks very similar to a Helm values file. And we can see here we have an apps value with an array under it with one application. We give it the name, version, replicas, ingress is not enabled, and the image that we want. In order to generate a manifest, we're going to say YTT minus F on our config file folder and the values file. And we can see that we get here a deployment and a service, and we've templated out all of the different labels and everything we need. If we take a look at a second example here, here we can see I've added in a second application. Here we've added in a few more values. We've defined some different ports than the defaults. And when we try this out, what we're going to see now is we actually get our first application as well as our second one, and it automatically templates and replaces those defaults that we set of 8080, for example, for the port with 80 and 443. Now, let's try a third example here, and we can see here that it fails. And this is one of the cool things that we get in YTT, which is schema validation. So here we can see that YTT failed on validating our data values on the first item in our apps array at the image field in our values file on line nine. And the error message we get is only images from internal registry are allowed. And this was enforced by our schema.yaml file on line 20. If we take a look at what we have in our schema YAML, we can see here that what we've defined is schema validation and we can give it whatever message we would like. And we say here, hey, check registry. And we can see here we have a function. This is just using the simple regular expression match to see that we're sitting in our my local harbor. And if the input image is not starting with harbor vrabi.cloud, then it is going to fail. And that's a really easy way that we can validate schema to make things work better. So there we go. Uh, so when we take a look here at our fourth one, let's try and add a CA cert to my deployment. And what we can see here, I'm just going to run the YTT minus F. And what we can see here is that actually our secret that gets generated automatically has the CA cert. Now, notice that it's indented by four spaces. And this is one of the nice things that is really different about YTT versus Helm, for example, is that what we have here is YTT is YAML aware. 
That means that it is structure where we don't need to deal with indent four, indent eight, how many indentations, it automatically generates that for us. So I'm not gonna go into the second one because I see that I'm running up on time here. Or actually I will, we're just gonna do it real quick. If we go into our Helm example, why is my terminal completely broken? Um, what we can see here is that what I did is I generated a Helm chart from the base Helm chart create. It gives us 298 lines of YAML. If I do the same command on my YTT, we can see that we can get the same configuration with 235 lines. Um, so we can actually lower the amount of YAML that we end up using. And the real cool one is that if I run a YAML validator against YTT, it is always valid YAML. Versus Helm, where we go into Go templating, we actually have issues where we aren't valid YAML because we're using Go templating as our mechanism there. So another example, if we take the cross example from Victor, 7,994 lines of raw YAML turn into 4,551. And the final thing, key That's takeaways. A great job, safe. Scott. Good job. Hey. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was really amazing. You're no, no. yeah. That's... He said Victor and he's cut off. <laughs> the moment you said Victor, you're timed out. You timed out. <laughs> That's it. Victor. That's the rule. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really great presentation, Scott. Thank you. We have a lot of good questions um happening in chat. We're gonna address those later during the QA section. So don't think we are we're missing out. We're we got you. But uh, we're gonna do our last presentation. Ellie's coming on next. Teach us about hi Ellie, welcome. Teach us about CD Kates. All right. Um, so CD Kates is a software development framework for defining Kubernetes manifests using uh, general purpose programming languages. So you can see kind of in a nutshell here on the left side, we write some code and on the right side, we get the corresponding Kubernetes manifest. And you might be wondering, well, which languages can we use? There's a variety of them. Right now we support Python, Java, uh, Golang, TypeScript, and JavaScript. And let's just go ahead and see a quick demo uh, right off the bat. So we're going to use TypeScript uh, here. And on the left, I have my uh, TypeScript code that defines a Kubernetes deployment and defines a Kubernetes service. And on the right, you can see that it basically uh, synthesizes what we call synthesizes into Kubernetes YAML. I think the, 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 the big advantage of using uh, this approach using code is that we get full uh, schema validation, uh, like that was mentioned, and we get type safety. So for example, if I neglect to specify uh, a container name, I'm going to get a compile error immediately when I type because a name is a required property in the deployment. And if I miss uh, specifying the selectors, Again, I'm going to get a compile error. So this thing is not even going to compile to a Kubernetes manifest unless you satisfy all the requirements. Uh, the other thing that is nice about this is that you get dynamic capabilities kind of by default, right? So first of all, uh, you can extract uh, common values into constants. So if we go ahead and extract this into a labels constant, oops, sorry, right? So then I can just use this labels. Uh, everywhere in my application. And you can see that this application actually requires this labels to be uh, specified the same thing uh, over and over again three times. You can just extract that to a labels uh, constant and be done with it. The other nice thing is you get uh, kind of uh, inline documentation in your IDE. You don't have to go to Kubernetes documentation. This is all available from the Kubernetes uh, open API schema. And all of, this, all of these classes, Kubernetes deployment, Kubernetes service, this is all auto-generated, right? So we didn't actually write the code for these classes. This is auto-generated from the Kubernetes API schema. And there's this massive, massive TypeScript file here that basically defines all the various Kubernetes objects that you can interact with uh, as part of your application. So that was, uh, that was the first part. And the nice part here is also that since this is code, right, you can also create kind of uh, multiple uh, uh, development environments or multiple manifests using simple constructor arguments or just arguments to your uh, to your uh, class, right? So if we define, let's say we define an in, uh, an interface here, uh, my chart props. So this is going to be an interface. Chart props, and we can also let's say we define how many replicas we want uh, this application to have, and we use this 
instead of uh, like this, <clears throat> right? And then we can instantiate multiple, multiple charts and passing different amounts of replicas depending on your environment. So this could be a prod that has four replicas. This could be a dev that has two replicas and so on and so forth. So this is kind of how you accomplish multiple environments using the same code base, essentially. OK, so now uh, the last thing I want to show you is another API that CDK has to offer. Let's just quickly get rid of this. So in addition to these low level, we call them layer one APIs. What you can actually do is use something called CDK Plus. And CDK Plus is another library that is provided by the CDK uh, team and by the community. And it basically provides higher level APIs to interact with the same Kubernetes object. So let's go ahead and kind of rewrite this application, uh, which just has a Kubernetes deployment and a service uh, that exposes that deployment. Let's use this new uh, library that's provided by CDK. So we're going to do this import. The library is called CDK Plus. And let's go ahead and remove all of this. OK, so on the right here, you should see this manifest go ahead, go go away, because right now my application is empty. Let's see that it actually works. I have like a background process that uh, supposed to synthesize. Yeah, all right, you can see those, this thing went away. So now let's define the same thing using this new uh, library. And we're going to do K plus. So we're going to define a deployment. Four, three, two. Okay, I didn't get one. to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, there you I have really it. appreciate your speed coding skills, though. You're so fast. That was impressive, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time and expertise and sharing it Thank with you. us. I'm going to bring everybody on for a QA section. Um, I'm going to start, actually, this I think was meant in jest, but this is a question I want chat to answer, actually, like who uses these tools? So if you're in chat and you use any of these tools, uh, please let us know and let us tell us what your experience is with them. And then we got a lot of good questions while we were going. Here's here's the uh, the Easter egg of the episode. Thomas, as he revealed, is holding a ukulele. So any questions you ask about customize will have some gentle ukulele music playing in the background, right, Thomas? <laughs> he didn't know that. He's I'm I'm saying something that he didn't necessarily agree to. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our customize. Oh, this lady laughs too much. That's me. I laugh a lot. That's uh that's just gonna be part of the show. So that's what you're signing up for as a viewer. <laughs> that's I'm gonna enjoy my life. Um. All right. So the question is, does customize have a release? and publish concepts like Helm. Uh, oh, yeah, so I need to do something with this. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so not really. Uh, you can configure the uh, manifest to uh, support the new release. So we have the way to define the new image, but we don't have uh, the, well, we don't have the lifecycle management that Helm uh, has within Customize. So Customize, is purely focused on uh, applying configuration, YAML in, YAML out. And then we use uh, kube control, apply, or a GitOps process like Inargo or Flux to handle the uh, publish uh, cycle. I hope that answers the question. And having the, the image name and tag in the customization object uh, lets you override it easily uh, when you release a new application as part of your CI CD pipeline you can set that new image, and there's actually a convenient um, command from the customized CLI, customize set image. You set the new image, and then uh, you probably trigger a continuous deployment cycle there, or depending on your configuration. But uh, yeah. Excellent. That's Thank it, you. Maybe a little a little ukulele riff real quick to finish off the a little flare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. Out of tune, but yeah. <laughs> Next question is for Andrew. Uh, what good practices do you think are important for writing Helm charts? Reusability. Always emphasize reusability. I can't think of a number of times that I've gone ahead and had the same type of action multiple times across my chart, 
going ahead and creating partials and then being able to then include them in other areas of a Helm chart so if I, uh, is very important. So if I want to be able to have a certain function that generates the name of some sort, I go ahead and I create a partial and then reuse that across multiple, multiple resources in the chart. And one of the benefits of uh, reusability is a concept in Helm called library charts. You can create these reusable functions that can be brought into multiple charts and then import them as a dependency. Excellent, thank you. Um, Scott, this one's for you. Can YTT integrate into the Helm ecosystem? And I'm actually gonna expand on this. You said it templates like Helm and it patches like customize. So yeah. I that uh, I had a similar question in my mind when you said that, like, is it an either or situation or can it integrate with these tools? So I, I think without going too long into this, but I, I think one of the cool things with the Carvel tool set overall and YTT in particular is that they really are composable and only do one thing, right? So. One of the cool things that I've seen done with YTT, and there's actually a great video from Robusta on this, um, where one of the challenges with Helm charts can be that a lot of times it is the de facto standard that vendors, you know, release software with. And what happens when the next day I need to have a value in there that isn't there? So I can fork the Helm chart, I can make the change, and then good luck rebasing when they release a new version, or I wait and create a PR and wait for it to be updated there. And that's an issue that we have overall, Not that's not a Helm issue, that's a issue of software that we get from vendors. And one of the cool use cases that we've seen is a lot of people doing Helm template and then running a YTT overlay on top of that. So use Helm for your base. And because YTT has that overlay functionality before applying to the Kubernetes cluster, use YTT on top of that. You can use it as a post renderer as part of the Helm CLI itself. Um, you can use that with KBuild also from the previous version from uh, video from Carvel. Um, so it can integrate. There's no built in integration between the two, um, but it's very easy to string them together um, using just pipes and CLI commands. Excellent. Thank you. And Andy, we got another one from you. Does Helm really support OCI registries? It does. It does support OCI registries. It was GA in uh, 3.8. We are adding a lot of features to OCI. OCI is an area that a lot of different tools are adding more and more support for. So I'm actually the lead for OCI integration in Helm. So any issues, go hunt me down. Then we can go ahead and add it to the feature set of Helm. But yes, it does support OCI registries. So you can say you can store your charts in the same location as your container images. As long as the image service, let's say you're using a hosted service, supports storing OCI artifacts. Most of them these days do support it. Cool. And uh, Ellie, we didn't forget about you, but <laughs> <laughs> this question for you, I feel like having the power of a whole language to essentially generate YAML is at odds with being declarative about things. Can you comment about that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's kind of the fact that the, the fact that you have uh, so at the end of the day, your infrastructure is declarative, right? So the, the output of CDK is going to be YAML, and you're going to have a declarative definition of your state that you can co-review and you can diff and all that. The fact that you might sometimes need imperative facilities and imperative capabilities to generate the declarative state is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Sometimes. Uh, manifests become very complex and become very boilerplate -y and have a lot of duplications. And that imperative capability of creating functions, calling methods, repeating values can be very powerful. Of course, you know, you can kind of abuse, abuse the imperative nature of it, but you can also go full declarative. Uh, in my demo, the first kind of uh, 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 screenshot that I showed is essentially declarative code, right? So the fact that you can turn it into imperative is just, uh, to your discretion and to your benefit, I feel. One thing I do when silly case is concerned, I don't know how common that this is with others, uh, you might tell me, but I do use silly case to generate YAML and then I push that YAML to Git so that it's yeah. processed by Argo CD and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah, whomever yeah, is actually interested to know the state, the desired state is actually not going through my silly case files, but through the output of silly case. Yeah. Yeah, you, there's, there's. I mean, I do a similar thing with the YTT, so that uh, Scott is not uh, left out. <laughs> We've seen multiple oh, yeah. patterns. Uh, a lot of a lot of 
pushing the generated manifests to your Git repo so that Argo can pick it up. We've also seen integrations with like writing configuration management plugins for Argo that generate the template during uh, during deployment, uh, ge generate the manifest. But it's 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 all there for you to use. The, the the manifest is there, and it's essentially what CDKs is all about. It's creating the manifest, and from that point on, take it and use it however you uh, you feel. Cool. So when I asked earlier what people are using, I got some answers. So I'm going to go through those. Um, Adya is using Helm and CD Kates. Sebastian uses Helm and Customize Sometimes. Daniel says Docker RMI and RMI. <laughs> move images, yes. That's the, that's the one. <laughs> yes. Uh, Adam says using CD Kates, Helm, and rarely some Customize. And that CD Kates works hand in hand with Helm and provides more flexibility and customization than Customize. Um, so this is uh, this these are this is a fighting question, but Lucian wants to know if I use Helm for my deployment. And a lot of these answers mentioned Helm and something else. So if I use Helm for my deployment, is there any reason to switch for something else, to something else? Or so everyone but Andrew, I want to answer this question. So like advocate for for like a full switch to your thing or or maybe talk about how well your the technology you're rep representing integrates with helm what that looks like so um ellie let's start with you yeah so i think uh it depends on i think kind of cdk shines really shines when when uh, uh things get more complicated um uh, and for a long time maintainability um it's uh it's it can be hard to kind of grasp the complexity of a, of a helm chart with all the all the different kind of dsls and go templating and functions there and if you're more familiar and you're more comfortable with coding right because maybe you were a software developer maybe you're using coding for your other uh kit for your other features then i think uh creating complex uh, uh manifests with cdk's or with general purpose programming languages is uh, has its advantages and you can still use CDKs and synthesize the manifests and then deploy with Helm. Actually, CDKs doesn't have any deployment capabilities. There is no CDKs deploy or install command, right? So you still need to deploy it some, sometime and you can use Helm for that. And we're actually working up on some uh, thinking about and discussing with the community about specific integrations uh, for CDKs to generate and to synthesize into Helm charts so that this can be passed directly into Helm um, for, for later installation. So yeah, I think the, the, the two are, are, are well equipped to work together. And I think it's just a matter of what you're comfortable with, whether it's Go templating language or code and the, the volume of complexity that your application has. Excellent. Scott, let's talk about YTT and Helm. Yeah, and so I kind of already covered in the previous yeah. question, you know, how YTT and Helm can be used together. Uh -huh. um, I think that YTT over Helm, again, if you're comfortable with Helm, I'm the last person to say you should change everything because, you know, some new technology came around. The question is, do mm -hmm. you have any pain points? I personally started in Helm and found pain points and found solutions in YTT for me. If you aren't having issues with mm -hmm. Helm and you're happy with it, stay with what it is. Don't go crazy and start changing things. I don't think there's any Kubernetes cluster that doesn't have a Helm chart deployed because mm -hmm. today, de facto, that is the standard for shipping software. For writing your own things, I think YTT is easier to grasp for devs and ops. I think that you get the benefit of like CD Kates type stuff from that side and the benefit of raw YAML from another side. And I think that's where YTT brings a value when you really need dev and ops to understand what's going on. Um, but if you're happy with Helm, stay with Helm. If it ain't broke. Yeah. Um, Thomas, let's talk about Helm and Customize. Yes. Uh, does it count if I say it depends? <laughs> but, <laughs> so Customize is very commonly used together with uh, Helm because, as Scott said earlier, you always get to a point where uh, you need to customize a parameter on a Helm chart, and that parameter perhaps is not templated yet. So either you submit uh, maybe a pull request to the project and wait for that to be uh, merged and released, or you fork it and then you have some management problems. So it's very common to see customized used as a post-process uh, operation after uh, templating files with Helm. So doing Helm template and then using customized 
to have that additional customizations because sometimes we don't have all the uh, options available in a Helm chart. And yeah, and then it depends on the use cases. Uh, it's all great tools, right? And it's great that we can use them together. So uh, what works for you, depending on your requirements, uh, I think that's good enough. I can't tell if you're finished with your answer because I haven't heard any ukulele. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Tom, Thomas is done talking. <laughs> um, we have a question. How do these tools compare to KPT? Victor, I have a question for you. What is KPT? KPT is, I mean, from certain aspects, it's definitely not the same, but for certain aspects, similar like the tools we are discussing now, right? It uh, transforms something into YAML, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the major difference is that it uses functions. So it goes through a series of functions, you know, mm -hmm. transform using function one, function two, function three, those functions are running as containers. Relatively new project, uh, not widely used, but very potentially promising. Um, do you, Victor, want to say, do you know how these tools integrate with KPT? I'm, I'm reluctant to give everyone a turn to talk. Let's let Andrew talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, like, I'm not going to talk about KTP, but I'll talk about Helm. Okay. Helm, as, okay. as everyone has just said, is the underpinning behind yeah. everything. Uh -huh. I work with a lot of organizations, very mature organizations. They mm -hmm. appreciate tools that have either ecosystem adoption or have been the standard for a while. They're not looking mm -hmm. to move to a one-off tool or tools that are emerging. They're very you know shy to that. So mm -hmm. most of my customers that I work with across the globe will go more towards Helm. And especially as we're developing this type of application, go with a tool that's, you know, standard, solid. We'll be there tomorrow. None of these tools, you know, open source projects come and go. Mm -hmm. How does, getting into the next question, how does, how does Helm, like, do any of these tools have features to encrypt secrets, which I can store and get? So Helm does not have a feature directly to encrypt secrets. You can mm -hmm. obviously create, so you can create secrets, you know, traditional base 64 secrets in Helm. You can use some of the spring templating that I mentioned previously, the functions. However, there are a number of different plugins that are part of the Helm ecosystem that are now available to assist with um, encrypting and decrypting values. So there's one for SOPs, there's one for sealed secrets. These are different plugins that the community has provided to it. One of the benefits of Helm is that ecosystem of plugins that are available. Does anyone else want to talk about their tool and secrets? Yeah, I, so YTT itself doesn't, but the Carvel tool set does, which integrates with YTT. So if you need it with YTT, you can do things with Mozilla SOPs uh, mm -hmm. within your YTT templates, and then Cap Controller knows how to get rid of those. Or you can use uh, Secret Gen Controller, another Carvel tool that integrates with YTT to do generation of secrets, um, but YTT oh. itself doesn't either. Got it. Yeah, C CDK also doesn't have specific provisions for secrets, um, mm -hmm. kind of the same way you would do that in, 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 the, in the manifest. But since this is code, right, CDK is code, you can actually plug in to the ecosystem. Uh, you can run whatever you, know, uh, whatever you desire as part of this kind of generation process of the manifests. And you can encrypt secrets from a service. You can fetch secrets from a service if you want. You can do system calls, network calls, whatever you want to do from within mm -hmm. this uh, uh, CDK's application, which is just general code. So you cool. can do whatever you need with it. Gotcha. Um, I. I think this has a short answer. Do all the tools integrate with popular GitOps tools like Argo or Flux? I think that's just a yes, they all do. <laughs> Is that correct? Yeah. Great. We knocked one out. We're running low on time, so we need to be succinct with our answers. But um, how can I change my image tag in CICD pipeline? I'm wondering if the tools have some out of the box feature for that. All Victor, of those too. All of those? Great. I mean, all of those allow you to change one way or another. Uh, mm -hmm. the output, the final output, right? The, whether in case of Helm would be values, in case of uh, CDK, it's, it's a programming language, customize, has even the command, customize edit image, if I remember correctly. Uh, and for YTT, again, you have, uh, you have values files similar, in a similar way as, uh, as Helm. So, I mean, correct me any if, you, if I'm wrong, right? But yes, 
I mean, yeah. I would say that actually not being able to do that would defy the purpose of all of those tools. And then this is our final question. I think even Victor, maybe it, this is a question for you. Does it make sense to keep infra de definitions in the same repo as your application definitions? I okay, oh. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I always separate out all my app, my definitions from my application, either w whether it's going to be for an application configuration or infrastructure configuration. Keep everything separate because they could have different release cycles. My answer was actually all different words, but almost the same. Without specifying keep it or not keep it, I think it, think about release cycle, right? Uh, what is the the frequency of releases of something? To to me, a good example would be a database, right? You can have a database that is dedicated to an application. Then it might or might not make sense to have it together with the uh, some other manifests of the application itself, or it could be shared and then it definitely should go out, right? So think of the cycle. What goes with what when you progress towards production or something? Wonderful. That's a wrap. Um, we're going to give you each just one, one sentence, maybe two sentences to say about your tool and then say goodbye for the day. So Ellie, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I just want to wrap up kind of what I didn't get a chance to in the demo uh, with this. That was uh, one thing. sentence. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me one more. Done. Okay, go. <laughs> Harsh. Harsh. Um, anyway, so CDK has this uh, CDK Plus library, which basically give you a simplified API, so you can write the same YAML with a lot less lines of code. Um, it's something that we as a team work on and the community works on. And CDK also can integrate with custom resources, which I didn't show. So you can actually interact with custom resource definitions using code uh, in the same way that you interact with the core Kubernetes manifest. Excellent. Great features. Goodbye, Ellie. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Oops, I cut her <laughs> off. <laughs> you are mean today. <laughs> I didn't mean okay. To. <laughs> you are mean. Everything. Th Thomas, tell us. Yes, oh, Customize uh -huh. is a simple tool to do configuration management. It comes built into your Kube Control CLI. You can use it in GitOps. It works with templates and pure YAML, so you don't have to learn a new language and you don't have to install additional tools. That is it. <laughs> yes! Plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> that is a twist, yeah. Scott, a, let's, give us a wrap on Carl YTT. Yeah, so I, YTT is really awesome because it really lets us do coding. It lets us do overlaying. It lets us do data values. So it lets us, it meets us where we want to be and what level of complexity we need. And the great thing about YTT is it is not a Kubernetes tool, meaning YTT can be used for anything you need YAML for. I use it for GitHub Actions, for Ansible Playbooks, for mm -hmm. anything that's YAML, you can use YTT, and that's what it's built for. So not being tied to Kubernetes actually gives it a huge benefit, I think, because we really, everything is YAML today. There's no such thing as a DevOps engineer, just YAML engineers, and templating YAML is a necessity. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. And Andy. Andrew. Yep. So Helm is a robust tool with broad ecosystem adoption. It's built into many tools that you use, everything from GitOps to uh, VS Code to IDEs. Use a tool that is going to be able to scale as you need. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And then there were two, just you and me again. Yeah. What? I'm having so much fun. This is the best. <laughs> Good. Otherwise, what would be the point? <laughs> You're not All that learning, be... whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So now what we need from everyone who's watching right now and everyone who's watching the recording, the next thing to do is to choose one of these technologies that we're going to build into our demo. Um, it's your turn exactly. to put the vote on your Twitter, but I know you're busy right after this. So yeah, so but soon there will be uh, there will be a vote or if you want to do it right away, Whitney, that's also OK. Okay. Uh, we, okay, so there we go. Whitney yeah, is going to put done. vote on her Twitter account, so you need to mm -hmm. memorize Vigiti Whitney. 
Yes. Subscri- so, follow. Uh, what what yeah. do people do in Twitter? I don't know. <laughs> Subscri- yeah, yeah, I think something. you can vote without following. If, uh, if if you find my laugh annoying, so you don't want to follow me, but you uh, but you do want to vote, you can still do that. Are you saying that you're you're laughing in Twitter as well? <laughs> kind of. You manage to <laughs> yeah. laugh over text. Every tweet I do text that I have is just my cackle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um please do vote make this fun um even um if you think uh, honestly all the technologies today are great but if you do think there's one that's bad especially vote for that one because then victor has to implement it and we can watch him sweat yeah. and so to clarify i'm not sure whether i said that in a previous episode there is a git repository there is a dis- link to the git repository in the description of this video and all other videos so you can navigate from the beginning until where we are through any 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 choices right so you're voting only what i'm going to do in the next episode not limiting the options in any form yeah. of way yes and i i think that's a wrap is there anything you got left to say do, do you want to try the monkey joke again yeah okay do it again yeah <laughs> hey do victor why why did the monkey fall out of the tree i don't know because it Why? was dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that was oh, a real boy. cough. Oh, that was. Oh, oh, that was so funny. Okay, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, Thank that, you. That's. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. It's been so fun. Can, by the way, I can also cry on demand. I, I oh, can. I can really? literally cry with tears and smile on demand. So. I, uh, so next time you're crying, I'll just be like, oh, he doesn't mean it. Forget about yeah, I him. Didn't, I didn't want to <laughs> offend you. I, I thought it could go. I can laugh at the joke or I can cry, but I, I want to be a nice guy, a nice person. <laughs> the one instance it ever happened. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming.